Jack Spillane is with us again. Jack, of course, is a columnist for New Bedford Light, an online newspaper that covers the city of New Bedford and surrounding towns. You can read Jack's work and other interesting stories at newbedfordlight.org. Good to see you again, Jack. Always good to be here, Jim. Well, the state's open meeting law was the topic of a recent Jack Spillane column in the New Bedford Light. Uh, the concern is that the New Bedford City Council is skirting the law, at least in some way, maybe skirting the law. Um, what's going on? Tell us all about this. So I, I, I may be um, the only person on the South Coast who's concerned about this, but I am concerned, and yeah. I, I will stand by that. Um, I'm not saying that they're, they're, they're violating the law. I think they're right at the edge of it, and I think the law has some um, flaws in it. But uh, I think it's particularly worrisome to me because I do feel that Councilor Mora has demonstrated an, uh, a willingness to uh, violate the law in the past. In the past year or so, she has um, had these e email polls of councilors where she's taken averages and things like that and then proposed motions on those averages. That was done, you know, uh, by email, and email um, coordination of a quorum is clearly a violation of, of the open meeting law. In this case, what she has done, and the last two council presidents did not do this, Joe Lopes for two terms and Ian Abu, uh, she has uh, started monthly meetings in the neighborhoods of the councils. So the first one was at Cafe Nemo a few weeks ago, and they, they posted it. Um, they call it a gathering, not a meeting. You tell me what the distinction is between a gathering and a meeting. Mm -hmm. But it was all of them. Now, the law allows people to socialize if they all happen to show up to a parade or, or a um, birthday party or something like that. There's nothing against that as long as they don't talk about city business. Now, th the rub is, how do you find out if they are having these meetings, which they have posted, which may not have been to their advantage to have posted it. But once you posted it, if you have a quorum, then the public is entitled to listen and see what you have to say. Now, how do you do that in the dining room of a busy restaurant? I don't know. The council is under obligation to let the public see and hear. The restaurant owner is a private business. He's not, or she's not. So uh, we um, sent a reporter over, and he sat at the bar, uh, but he could not hear them. Now, uh, there is some case law on this. In Fall River, they had five, which is a quorum in Fall River. Um, this, by the way, was not a quorum. So That's not right. Clear. Only five there. But there could have been because all of them were invited. Okay. Um, uh, so in Fall River, there was a quorum, um, and someone filed a formal complaint with the Attorney General's office, but the Attorney General ruled that he said, well, we, we could not prove that they were talking about city business. We asked all five of them. They all said no. Well, that's an honor system, and I like elected officials and politicians as much as anybody, but I've known them to not tell the truth on occasion. And so... Really? <laughs> yes. And so uh, uh, the uh, Attorney General's office ruled that it was not a violation. So uh, the problem in, in that meeting wasn't even posted. Uh, this one was posted, and once you post it, then the quorum law kicks in. Ironically, as I understand it, if you don't post it, then the quorum law would not kick in. But... Even if you don't post it, if you begin to talk public business, the public business law, uh, the open meeting law kicks in. Mm -hmm. So how do you know is my objection. That's what I was trying to get at in the column. Uh, if the restaurant owner will let you pull up a seat and um, be, be close enough, if there was one table close enough that you could listen to them. If, if, if the restaurant owner will let you monopolize that for two hours, then I guess you could, depending on how many people from the public want to be bothered to listen to this. But it seems to me it gives them the opportunity. And if you're going to do it every month, sooner or later they're going to drift in by accident or otherwise into public business of some sort. And because, you know, city bodies, not just in New Bedford, have been known to violate this in the past, I, I just don't think it's a good idea. Now, their counter-argument is that this is an attempt to get out to the neighborhoods to support city businesses. I think you can do all that by just having two or three whoever the ward counselor is, and maybe a couple of at-large counselors, maybe a nearby ward counselor, two, three, four. But once you get into the five and six realm, and your your six is the quorum in your bedford, then you know I do think you have an obligation because I'm not satisfied by the honor system. Um, uh, and if you have posted it, which they did in this case, mm -hmm. then you do have a right to pull up a chair. Um, it's just that the council has an obligation to let you listen how do they accomplish that when they are not in control of the restaurant? 
if they want to rent a function room to have a, you know, say, sometimes you see this with a big meeting. Sure. You, you rent a function room and then you have the council on a dais and, and you have an audience, then that's easy enough accomplished. But these meetings, if they do have a quorum, I think it's worrisome. I think there have been violations in the past, so I was worried about it and I thought the public should know. Um, okay. Um, this was Bill, though, as you said, Bill, though, it's a gathering and not a meeting. That's right. Um, and uh, there were counselors there. I don't recall who, by the way, I saw the picture. They were all smiling. I can tell you who they were. They were, they were, they were Brian Pereira, <laughs> uh, Shane Virgo, yeah. uh, Linda Morad, Naomi Connie, Maria Giesta. So uh, Pereira, for instance, is a long way from Ward 6. And uh, I mean, he just, he just well, showed. Well, that, that, they so were all invited, that, though, That's right? the other thing. If, if they had been invited by email, or by a phone call, a quorum of them, all of them. Yep. That to me seems like a communication outside the council meetings. Now, you are, they posted it, which is also a communication. Um, in my discussions with the Attorney General, my understanding is that they actually were in more danger by posting it because now you have to be able to listen to it. Now, if they hadn't posted it, you don't have to be able to listen to it except if someone happens to be nearby and, and he hears that they are discussing city business, then it's a public meeting, mm -hmm. and that now you have to. So I think the state wants you to be able to have people just show up to a birthday party or a um, parade or a celebration and not have to worry about the open meeting law. But this is scheduling a meeting. Everybody is invited. You know, I, I get the purpose, but I don't think you need the full council. I think, I think Councilor Moore is very interested in changing the council's image. It, because I said a negative image for, for virtually the entire uh, two decades that I've been here, and before that, people, yeah. and you always hear people complaining about how they get reelected, but they do get reelected. Um, uh, so I think she's trying to get, give this positive image, but I, I just don't think this is the way to do it. So what did they talk about? The soup? What was it? I wasn't there. I don't know. <laughs> I, you know I, I, I was in Florida when I heard about it, but I heard about it. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, you have a chat this week with candidates for the Ward 3 council seat, uh, Sean Oliver and Carmen Amaral, and will that be on the New Bedford Light site sometime this weekend? Yes. Yeah. So what we do is when we do these chats, um, we, we do them live, and you can watch it live if you care to. It's at 7 p.m. on Thursday, but the vast majority of people listen to them the way you would listen to a podcast. Uh, it's a video cast, but, but um, so then we put it on the site, and we'll leave it there until the election if not beyond, uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. All right, so uh, if you didn't catch it on Thursday night, uh, check out newbedfordlight.org if you're interested to hear Sean Oliver and Carmen Amaral. They, of course, are the candidates for the Ward 3 Council seat. They're being questioned by Jack Spillane. Yeah. I, I, I will just say that some interesting things happened since we got to the final stage of this campaign. There's been a lot of endorsements come out. The police union and AFSCME have endorsed um, uh, Sean Oliver. Yeah. Uh, the new sheriff, Paul Hero, has endo endorsed Carmen Amaral, who already had the endorsement of Save Our School. So you're beginning to see who supports who in yeah. these races. Well, of course, and again, we wonder how endorsements, how effective they really are, but uh, I, they're out there. They're yeah, part of the I, landscape. I agree with you that they're not particularly effective, but they do tell you something about who other members of the public perceive these candidates to be and what their values are. You're listening to Town Square Sunday. I'm Jim Phillips. My guest is Jack Spillane, columnist for the New Bedford Light. You can read Jack's work at newbedfordlight.org. Speaking of the chat segment, you recently delved into the world of higher education with a recent chat with uh, UMass Dartmouth Chancellor Mark Fuller. Uh, I thought that was uh, fairly interesting. I know he's concerned about increasing enrollment and retaining students. Uh, that's a pretty big job with the cost of higher education these days. Um, but I guess he has made some gains over the past, over the recent past. Yeah, um, he has made some gains, I think, particularly in the graduate schools, but, but also undergraduate. Um, uh, this is a very interesting guy. He's uh, been at UMass but now. Uh, he's just beginning his third year. His he uh, was first the interim chancellor, and then in August of 21, he became the full-time chancellor. Um, he had some, a lot of success at UMass Amherst uh, bringing the Eisenberg School of Management 
high up into the rankings of management schools um, in the country, mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S. News and World Report rankings. Um, so he, UMass Dartmouth, especially since the pandemic, has had significant enrollment problems. Uh, part of it, I think, is the cost of higher education has gotten so uh, expensive that a lot of families are going to the junior colleges first. The other part of it is that you know the college education is no longer the guarantee of a job, which we've seen with some of the recent Vote Tech discussions. And so he's trying to get those back up. He's also trying to get the alumni giving up, uh, going up. I gave him a little bit of a hard time saying I, I thought that sports was a um, way to get the alumni giving and maybe moving UMass Dartmouth from a Division three school to a Division two school, which was talked about a few years ago but didn't happen, might help. But he, he really thinks that um, Division three is more in the spirit of what college collegiate athletics should be. I don't know whether it's a dollar and cents thing, but that's his position. That's interesting. Um, there's been a lot of uh, turnover in the university leadership in the past decade or 15 years. Uh, it was interesting to me that Fuller said he wanted to stay for a while. He yes. wanted to be there. I, I was very encouraged by that because there has been um, a lot of turnover with um, Davina Grossman. Then they had um, a, an interim chancellor who's from Pennsylvania whose name escapes me. And then they had Robert Johnson. None of them stayed for more than two or three years. But it all added up to seven or eight years yeah. at the school. And I think um, I was um, surprised by his candor in, in acknowledging that that may have hurt the school um, in its continuity. Yeah, I, I thought uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, some, somewhat refreshing in terms of usually when people in those kind of jobs are somewhat guarded, mm -hmm. somewhat guarded, but yeah. uh, he didn't seem to be. I interesting. He, he bills himself as transparent. I think he was fairly transparent. He... Um, I was particularly interested in the SMAS and the um, College of Visual and Performing yeah. Arts, and although he said he supports both, he didn't make any guarantees, especially with the CVPA um, staying in downtown New Bedford because it needs, um, I think it's $32 million worth of work on that building. Um, that university, uh, many years ago, we talked about a long time, uh, for a long time we talked about the importance of that university to the region. Is it that important right now? What do you think about uh, UMass Dartmouth? That's just a great question, Jim. I think uh, UMass Dartmouth has changed. I think it was maybe six, seven years ago we began hearing that it was a research university now, and they've been trying to grow the graduate school, which has a lot of uh, students, international students, and yeah. students from outside the region. I, I think that's a good thing. I, I also think um, a lot of people want to go to school close to home, and they want quality school. And, UMass Dartmouth has always been that flagship of the state university, a little bit above the uh, state colleges, which are, are good, but, but you know, the, the, the higher academic students who tend to go to UMass Dartmouth. Um, uh, I, you know, I, he says that they have room for every local student who wants to, to go and who qualifies. I asked him who qualified, and he said, you, you're going to have about a 3.25 GPA. Now, the college board, not quite as important as it used to be, but you've you got to have more than a B average to, to get in there. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. That may be a challenge for many. Look, um, New Bedford School Superintendent Thomas Anderson is a finalist for the job of superintendent in Newton. Uh, we may um, hear something even before this program airs. So, uh, But I, I, I do know we've had a flurry of superintendents in New Bedford over the past 15 years or so. New like changes in UMass. Same thing in the city of New Bedford. We don't know if Anderson is leaving, but I was surprised overall that there's been such a turnover at this position. Uh, by the way, it'll be a significant pay jump if he, if he does take the new job, yeah. if he's offered and does take it. An entirely different kind of community. Oh, absolutely. Newton is about the same size as New Bedford, but a much more affluent um, community and um, uh, less of a community of color than, than New Bedford. Um, uh, I, I knew Superintendent Anderson as an African American student would be in, uh, uh, superintendent would be in high demand. Um, uh, he has calmed the waters in New Bedford. Uh, uh, everybody likes him. How um, much I, I personally was a fan of Superintendent Pia Durkin. Um, I know she was not an easy person to get along with, but she did ask for the resignations of half the the faculty, and I think that that helped the school in its ability to to, to get rid of some people who were maybe not. Uh, doing the job as well as they could have. Uh, uh, 
Durkin was not sustainable in the long run. Um, Jack Nabrego and I may have been the, the two people that were fans of her in, 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 in the city. And Anderson has been here, it's, it's, it's been calm. The graduation rate is up. I, I would think he's in high demand. And I know he has um, two college-age children, so that higher salary may come in handy for him if he gets it. Sure. Um, I, I'll go on record and say I was a fan of Durkin, too. Not that I'm not a fan of Anderson, but, you know, uh, Durkin was uh, here at the right place and the right time. Yes. And then gradually I, that changed. I think she did the heavy lifting. Yeah. And <laughs> I think Anderson benefited from the lifting she did, but I also think he is a much more um, people-friendly person and a person that the faculty and um, administrators uh, could have confidence in. Uh, Peter Durkin was kind of like that hired gun that you bring in that she has to do some things and sure. she does them and, and then she wears out her welcome. <laughs> Jack Spillane, columnist for New Bedford Light, joining us every few weeks to comment on local news happenings in our region. Thanks for your time once again, Jack. Always a pleasure, Jim.